Welcome back to Risk, everyone. Today, I have a very special guest, Dr. Mark Faber, a uh, longtime analyst of the markets. He is uh, author of the Gloom, Doom, and Boom Report. Welcome, Mark. It's great to see you again. Well, thank you very much for having me on your program. So I, I have a bit of a, a long-winded question here, but I think it really kind of gets to the heart of the matter. I, I know you've argued that uh, d democracy, to, to some extent, has brought us to a point where we're living under more authoritarian, arguably, conditions than the Eastern Bloc, the old Eastern Bloc did. Now, I, I'd like to argue that back in, in the day, uh, our, our prosperity in the, in the West was brought through economic freedom and the government securing private property rights. And it wasn't necessarily democracy that brought us to the prosperity, but it was it was the freedom that did. And I, I think arguably we are living under much more totalitarian governments these days. <laughs> and at the heart of that, I know you've alluded to this in, in past interviews, seems to be the World Economic Forum, which seems to have trained and educated pretty much every world leader from Macron to Trudeau. Would you agree with all that? Yes, to some extent. Uh, I mean, uh, it, the history of societies is very interesting. And uh, also the philosophical history of freedom is, and the concept of freedom is important to understand because as Spinoza explained, you can have a kind of natural law, say, at the beginning of the world, there were obviously very few people in the world, and they lived in small families or groups or individually, and uh, might was right. In other words, if you, if you felt hungry, then you went and hunted for your hunger. And if you felt like helping someone, you helped someone. And if you felt like raping a woman, then you did it. <laughs> that was all natural. There were no, there was no moral code. Mm -hmm. And then as societies or as people, moved into communities, into villages, and then cities, you had to have some common grounds and some rules that would ensure, ensure the safety. So laws came up that it's not a very good idea to kill your neighbor and to rape your neighbor's wife and so forth. And uh, so the individual freedom was replaced to some extent by a collective freedom, by collective laws, a lo collective legal system. And I think by the 19th uh, century, we reached kind of a, almost a peak in individual freedom and the beginning of organized societies in a stricter sense. And uh, after the government became larger and larger within the economic system, say, I measured the size of the government within the individual system by government expenditures as a percent of GDP. So it's difficult to measure that in the Middle Ages. And in the Middle Ages, we didn't have democracies, but we had some cities where there was a lot of freedom. Uh, um, amidst certain rules. But anyway, uh, in 1910, no government in the world uh, spent more uh, and collected more tax than, say, 10% of GDP. So the government was small and the private sector was big. Now, the private sector has shrunk and the government has become bigger and bigger. The extreme is, of course, the planning economy, the socialist communist regimes of the socialist economies like the Soviet Union, communist China, Vietnam in its days, and uh, to some extent, the socialist economy of India, which was built on self-reliance and independence from foreigners and so forth. 
But anyway, those systems, they didn't lead to a lot of prosperity, as you know, whereas the capitalistic system, uh, the free market economy, as you pointed out, led to strong economic growth. And I have to point out again and again, because people don't believe it, in the 19th century, when we didn't have central banks, uh, and when regulation was relatively small, we had stronger GDP per capita increases than in the 20th century, when the government expanded, when we had all the social institutions coming up, and when we had central banks. The central bank in America was formed in 1913, to the chagrin of lots of people, because a lot of people didn't like the idea of having centralized credit, uh, a centralized credit system, which was, by the way, advocated by Karl Marx in the capi in the capital. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, and, and when you argue that uh, they, they were right, the, the ones who were opposing the central bank? Personally, I think it would be better to have, uh, first of all, different currencies. And we see that we have different uh, cryptocurrencies. Some will fail and some will survive. And if you have a different banking system and each bank issues its currency, some currencies will be healthy and some will be unhealthy. And the investor will have the uh, responsibility or the depositor will have the responsibility to which bank he wants to deposit his money. Now he can choose, he can deposit his money with the US government, in other words, in US dollars or in uh, India, in Indian rupees or in Hong Kong dollars or in Chinese RMBs and in Brazilian cruzeiros and so forth. So that is still a possibility, but it's still with a centralized uh, banking system. But essentially, I think, I think it's been proven that uh, those bank, those banks are not very safe from government interference and confiscation. And we've seen it again and again in many countries. Would you agree? Well, it's good that you're pointing this out because I didn't think that I would have to see this in my life. But when you think of it, for the first time, you have a group of people that have uh, had their assets being seized, the evil Russian oligarchs. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're all evil, just black, all evil. Who the judge was who decided that, uh, which cult decided that, which <laughs> church decided that, I'm not sure, but it was decided by some people, they're the evil ones. And we are going to seize these assets. And in Canada, in a democratically elected uh, government, uh, we had a government that seized the assets of some people that supported peaceful demonstrations. But they condone that go and destroy stores and steals from stores and loots all over the place and commits crime. But you understand the point? We, we reached uh, an era where it's no longer safe to have any assets because the government can arbitrate come in and say, well, you don't have a vaccine, so we're going to seize your assets or we're going to seize your pension or we're going to take this away from you or that away or you have no right to leave your apartment and so forth and so on. You understand, this has never happened in history before. I, I believe this is the antithesis of capitalism as well. I beg your pardon? I believe that, that those phenomena are the antithesis of capitalism. Yeah, I don't know who exactly is behind. You alluded to the v 
WEF, the World Economic Forum. I agree with you, the World Economic Forum is like an Ivy League university of uh, authoritarian politicians that aim to coordinate policies. And uh, luckily, we have a world when uh, the Western world and the Western leader says, oh, the whole world has sanctioned Putin. They mean 12% of the world's population. Right, right. <laughs> you know, the, all the Latin American countries did not uh, sanction Russia. Africa didn't sanction Russia. Uh, the Middle Eastern countries didn't sanction him. Uh, China, India, and so forth. So it's a big world. Uh, and we have to be very clear about this. It began with the opening of China in 78 and the rapid expansion of the Chinese economy, which was followed by the breakdown of the Berlin War, Wall and then the opening of India, you know, the reform movement, especially after Modi was elected. We have a new world where the new world has become economically as or more important than the old world. You know, you look at how many internet users there are in India, how many internet users there are in China, consumers in China and so forth. These markets, because of the size of the population, I'm not giving here a value judgment about is the system in China better than in the Western world. And so I'm just presenting statistically that uh, in India and China, you have 2.6 billion people living. And in America, you have 330 million. And in Europe, maybe also 300, 400 million, depending how, how you want to measure it. But these countries in the emerging world is very big. And so they have a huge economic impact. And a lot of these countries don't want to be vassals and uh, kind of slaves of the US and of European powers. They, because they already experienced being slaves of these Western countries sure. during the age of colonialism. So they don't want to go back to this system. And they're very highly suspicious of Western people's good intentions. Don't uh, take me wrong. I think our Western civilization has meaningfully improved the world in terms of creating better living conditions than any other system had but that had to do with free markets and the capitalistic system. It didn't have so much to do with, uh, so much to do with democracy. But now, a lot of Westerners, they think that they should kind of rule the world and only the US should have a sphere of influences and others uh, shouldn't have. There's an interesting case now happening in uh, nearby Australia, between essentially Australia and Papua New Guinea in the Pacific. There you have the Solomon Islands. The mm -hmm. Solomon Islands, they're very close to Guadalcanal, where the big battles occurred in World sure. War II. Yep. Anyway, uh, anyway, there, the Chinese, have reached, don't ask me how, maybe it was a lot of money involved, but they have reached an agreement with the sovereign government of Solomon to have a securities arrangement with China and the Solomons. <coughs> now, the Western world, of course, says, well, this is an aggression against Australia and against the Western world. Well, you know, to Ukraine agree, uh, the Russians thought that to establish NATO in Ukraine, 
and building uh, missile bases next to Russia was so, some sort of aggression that the West very, said. Very, oh, very I, good comparison, yes. You understand? Yes, I absolutely. think we need to be very careful in terms of applying double standards. Uh, we, the Western world, applauded the Americans going into Iraq, into Afghanistan, Maybe we didn't applaud it, but we condoned it and we didn't criticize it sufficiently. And we didn't say anything when they went in and murdered. I want to point this out, murder Gaddafi. You know, I had heard that uh, Gaddafi... And Saddam Hussein, they also murdered. Oh, oh absolutely. I, I had heard that Gaddafi was trying to establish his own banking system based on precious metals and that was why he was taken out <laughs> whether that's true or not i don't know but that's what i have heard uh, apparently he wanted to do kind of a currency based on gold mm -hmm. and settle oil sales but for me it's very clear some people in the western world wanted to grab their oil period <laughs> because and they didn't like him although it's was in Africa the most affluent country. Mm -hmm. They had social security, they had free health care, they were relatively well taken care of. And you know the, the Middle East is the Middle East, there are lots of different tribes, and to bring them all together into one country is not so simple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm as they still see now in Syria and in uh, Iraq and in uh, Yemen and in uh, Libya and so forth. It's not so simple. <laughs> you, know, you know, Mark, with that thought, do you see issues ahead for the European Union? Because, you know, for centuries, all these different countries have had their own unique culture. They've been butchering each other for <laughs> thousands of years. Yes, sadly Who true. that war for nothing? Yep. I mean, most wars, if you look back, are in the interest of some rulers of the elite. Uh, and some people make a lot of money out of wars. And the poor people starve and uh, get impoverished and die on the battlefields. The rich people never are in the front line of battlefields or seldom. The Roman emperors sometimes went at the front of their armies. Mm -hmm. Alexander the Great, same, was at the front row of his armies. Absolutely. Yeah. But the Vogue politicians, they sit in Washington in comfortable armchairs and say, yeah, maybe it's a good idea to make a war here. We don't need to send our own soldiers, let them fight, <laughs> and so forth. You know, it's a dirty game. From a moral point of view, it's a very vicious game. Yeah, no, I, I can't uh, disagree with anything you've said there. Europe, Go I ahead. think this whole business with Russia and Ukraine is a big negative long term for Europe. Well, I agree with you. I mean, just the implications of food pricing and commodities with uh, the trouble in Ukraine, because I mean, Ukraine has traditionally been the breadbasket of Europe, correct? Yes, Russia and Ukraine, they supply 25% of the world's wheat and it go flows out essentially from the Black Sea, Odessa and uh, uh, the Krim Islands. And, uh, you know, the largest importer of wheat from Ukraine and Russia is Africa. Number one country is Egypt. Mm. And you have to see as someone, okay, I want to clarify this uh, point of view. I am a beneficiary of the money printing of the last 40 years. This has not distracted my mind from being one of the very few people who has consistently criticized the Federal Reserve for printing money. Because based on history, the money printing is a curse that in the long run has 
lots of very negative implications on a society, on the wealth distribution, and on the economy. But anyway, uh, that aside, the increase in food prices is going to hurt the poorest people the hardest. You know, I was having dinner tonight with someone and he owns a restaurant and he said now he pays for 30x, 110 instead of 90. I mean, I said I eat 30 eggs in like three months, so, so <laughs> it doesn't matter. And uh, the price of rice in Thailand hasn't gone up a lot. But for poor people, if the price of wheat goes up or down, it has a huge impact because you and I, maybe we spend maximum 2% of our income on food. Maybe we spend 20% on booze or drugs or whatever. <laughs> I don't take drugs, but on alcohol, I spend something. But for ordinary people, 30% of the income is probably spent on life necessities. These are things like food, energy, and heating in winter time, and cooking oil, and, and coal for the cooking oven, and so forth and so forth. So 30% goes there. So when the price goes up, they have less money for other things, including education. And I think on a moral ground, one of the worst things that can happen in life is that you impoverish the most vulnerable classes of society. In a free market, like we talked about it before, we can have abuses and so forth. But over time, they are corrected by the market. But if uh, you have deliberate money printing by central banks, and I give you an example. In Spain, and say in the Netherlands, in Holland, both countries have announced their inflation rate currently running, consumer price inflation, uh, running at over 10%, okay? The ECB run by Mrs. Lagarde, she was convicted and on the way to jail, but then somewhere, somehow, you know, politicians, they never go to jail because they have a different legal system than for ordinary people. But anyway, she is the head of the ECB. Because in politics, when you're corrupt and very corrupt, you get, you get promoted. promoted. <laughs> Absolutely. So this is the, this, the way it works. And so she, until recently, she claimed, oh, there's no inflation. Then she said, oh, it's just a transitory phenomenon. Well, this has been building for years because interest rates were always so far below the cost of living increases. You know, so you had zero interest rates, the government expanded, fiscal programs expanded, the deficits expanded, everything, which is inflationary. But inflation is a funny thing. You know, Bernanke said, well, you work and drop dollar bills onto the US, yes. What you don't know is where the dollar bills will flow to. So they float to, say, stocks, and they float to the real estate market, and properties went up and so forth. But rising property prices is also negative uh, for most people, because most people don't own the properties. And then it depends when property prices, uh, when interest rates go up, and the burden on the household also increases in terms of mortgage payments and the taxes go up and so forth and so on. So in general, I would say we are faced in the Western world. By Western world, I define the most developed countries of Europe, Japan and uh, Australia, Canada. We are faced for the first time in, say, 150, 200 years with a generation that earns less and has less wealth than their fathers. This generation, the millenniums and the generation Z is poorer and earns less than my generation, 
the traditional generation and the baby boomers. I'm born in between. Yeah, it's it's definitely uh, shifted. I mean, a lot of kids are leaving, living at home still in their 30s and 40s because they can't afford their own place, etc. Yeah, nothing. Yeah. Uh, now, you mentioned um, food prices going up. Do, do you think that's going to lead to global instability and food riots, etc.? Well, we already had. We had in Sri Lanka. Yep. Uh, some riots, they were not only because of food, but it was a contributing factor. We had it in Peru. I think uh, we have today a disconnect between ordinary people and the government that has never existed before. I'll give you an example. In America, some mayors, as you know, they have decided to defund the police. I've never heard a more stupid idea than to defund the police at a time when crime is already high. Chicago is, I wouldn't call it a war zone, but it's not a particularly safe place anymore. And uh, they defund the police, but the mayor Lighthouse, she has now for her own security, 70 staff to look after her around the clock. So what you do is uh, like someone, when this immigration wave came into Germany and into France, someone wrote rightly in the paper all this uh, refugees coming from North Africa and the Middle East, they're of course not living next to Mrs. Merkel's house. They're in other areas, but uh, Mrs. Merkel is not affected by them. But the people that live in these areas where suddenly you have a majority of Muslims, they may not like it a lot. You understand? Yep, yep. The, it changes the character of a country. And just recently, I mean, it's a very interesting case. And I think it may cost him a lot of uh, votes because they have now the elections in France. Yesterday, or two days ago, someone broke into the house of a farmer, okay? The farmer is alone at home with a three-year-old daughter. But anyway, so they broke in. And the farmer, rightly, he grabs his gun and shoots at them. And he shoots one who dies. And the other then take off. Now, it, he was arrested by the police for having shot someone. He was released on bail or whatever. And Macron then came out and said, oh, this man is a criminal because he shot someone he should have called the police <laughs> now i want you to vi visualize you sit in your bedroom or your living room the four intruders start coming your little daughter of three years sits there and you in this situation you should tell the intruders please wait a minute i need to call the police no. it, it is absolutely absurd Mark. It is absurd. You grab your gun and you shoot at one of them. Yep, no doubt about it. I, I think this kind of comes back to the government moving away from protecting private property. You know, I mean, this is, it's the same kind of philosophy where, where our property and life do not do not matter to them anymore. I tell you, for me, this is the thing I've been thinking about in the last three weeks the most. You have, say, assets and Traditionally, you would say to someone, well, you know, you need to diversify stock, bonds, uh, commodities, uh, properties, uh, collectibles, and so forth. And uh, you need to diversify geography, so you invest some in Asia and some in the US and some in Europe and some in Latin America, something like this. Now, the question is, well, if you invest in Asia and in America and in uh, Latin America and Europe, 
through the same custodian and the custodian is in the US and you don't get the vaccine and the US says oh, we're not going to freeze your assets, what good is the diversification for? Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, I guess you have to diversify your flow through points of your assets as well. I think the world, I mean, uh, Biden, he claims that he united uh, NATO. I'm not so sure about that in the long run, because every war is always popular in the first 30 days. But afterwards, uh, you know, people start to think twice about why it happened and so forth. And some people then gradually wake up. It's not black and white. Uh, my sense is that having seen the expropriation or the seizure of assets of the oligarchs, a lot of well-to-do people will think, well, I may not like India, and I may not like Asia, and I may not like China, but maybe it's better to have the custody of some of my money or have some of my money physically outside the Western Alliance, which is the, from the Far East, Japan, Australia, then the US, UK, Canada, Western Europe. Some people will say, maybe I better have some money in Dubai or maybe in Hong Kong, maybe in Mumbai, in India, and so forth. So I think these are things that uh, the world has been split in to, in my opinion, more obviously than before into the Western, what the world perceives as an arrogant uh, alliance and the other countries that say, well, we are a sovereign nation. We can do whatever we want. Would you believe that? I mean, would you argue that that arrogance of the West has been built on the petrodollar and, and that error is swiftly ending i'm not sure it's built on the petrodollar i rather think it is uh, built on a geopolitical view of the world that uh, the us is the divine country uh, because they have democracy and because uh, they are the well-meaning uh, <laughs> country you know I well, can that, tell that, you. That, that's how it's it, been sold in the media, but I, I think arguably. Yes, 80% of the world doesn't believe that BS anymore. If you go to Af Afghanistan and you ask about the benevolence of the democracy of the US, they, they, they don't have much understanding for that, neither in the Middle East or in Libya or in Syria or Iraq and so forth. So I think people are very skeptical of that view. You know, you know, Mark, my, my view on this is we were up until World War II, but post-World War II, we kind of got into this League of Nations, United Nations effort. I mean, you, you look at Korea, Vietnam, these were all police actions under, you know, world body of, of the United Nations and, and such. So I, I think we've really lost that moral high ground in, in the post-World War II era. I wanted to say this, this Ukraine business, exposes the hypocrisy of the Western world. Yeah, I, I agree but completely. No, yep. Nobody ever talked about the millions, and it, I'm not exaggerating, the millions of people that through the food embargo with Iraq went in, into starvation in Iraq. Yeah, and died. I've seen just recently a documentary about Afghanistan, about a small village. This is now not fake news from a Russian propaganda movie and so forth. This is the reality. The people in that village have no money. They have hardly any food. They have no jobs. There's no industries there. So what they do is they sell their parts of the bodies. Wow. They let themselves be operated, take out uh, a kidney or, you know, the, the, they can't take out the whole heart. But I don't know. They do all kinds of operations there on the spot. And that is then shipped outside wow. Afghanistan. 
I suspect most of it goes to China. But if it goes to China, it can also go elsewhere. But I'm just saying there are some really destitute people in the world. And with all these interventions of the Western world, whatever war, a lot of people got hurt very badly. But they never discussed this. But when it comes to Ukraine, when they can uh, paint uh, Putin and Russia in a negative light, they do it. And I just like to also point out, in 2018, we had the World Cup in Russia. Prior to the World Cup, all the Western media were very negative about Russia. And they warned people, don't go to Russia. And then they sold 100 million tickets in America to watch games. You know? So yeah. uh, there was the people are much more friendly towards or say they're much more open to us accepting that it's not black and white, but the governments and supported by the media, they want to let it appear like black and white. But I don't want to digress, digress too much from the investment implications. We don't know yet exactly what the investment implications are from this war, because it also depends how long it will last. But judging by the Western world's reaction, I think uh, the war is actually not about some small territory in East of Ukraine. It is about taking out Putin and bringing down Russia to its knees. I think that's the issue. Do you think that's the, the reason for the sanctions as well? I mean, from my perspective, I think they're going to hurt Europe a lot more than they are Russia. This will be interesting to see. At the present time, Russia has a huge trade and current account surplus because there are very few imports that are coming in. Right. But the sanctions, the, the, Russia has been under sanctions for a long time. After 2014, they started because Russia took back uh, Krim Island, uh, the Krim Peninsula which, by the way, is 98% inhabited by ethnic Russian people. But anyway, uh, they were under sanctions. What happened? Because of the sanctions, agriculture grew, grew a lot in Russia, and many industries developed a lot. Normally, sanctions have uh, some negative implications, but long-term rather positive because then the industries uh, have to adapt and produce goods locally. And just open a map and look at the size of Russia and the borders of Russia with China, with uh, Mongolia, even with North Korea. And then uh, you have the borders with Kazakhstan and uh, the Central Asian republics, and then the, towards the West and so forth, the Baltic countries. I'd say smuggling is one of the easiest things to do between the whole world and Russia. Just because it has such a vast border. Is porous, yeah. You know, the, you, especially if you have a, a friendly relationship with China and ships, they move around and so forth. You can't enforce. But I'd like to say one thing about the sanctions. About ten years ago when I still went frequently to Switzerland and I stayed in a hotel, which was a very unusual place. Uh, we used to have uh, every Saturday or Sunday uh, lunch. And uh, one uh, 
person came, he was disabled. Uh, he couldn't walk properly. And he was not very good in terms of his body. I don't know what he had. I never asked. But he was working for a company. There are only three or four in the world. They make uh, amplifiers for professionals. These are amplifiers for discotheques. And for, like you, if you're a music lover, you need special amplifiers. You need special cables. You need special loudspeakers and so forth. And so on. everything has to be special. And each installation will cost you between, say, uh, half a million to maybe three, four million US. Very He's a he was a specialist for amplifiers. Yeah. So they had some clients, some, I guess, oligarchs or whatnot in Russia. And he couldn't sell. He was working for a company. They couldn't sell from Switzerland to Russia. But they could sell to an agent in the United States. And he would sell to Russia. Oh, OK. There's always a way around, right? There's always a way. <laughs> so, now, you know, I know you've, you've said that gold is... Uh fairly expensive at these levels uh I, I also know that you think that it's it's probably a good place to put some money what, what are your thoughts on silver platinum and other uh other metals yeah we were just talking tonight about silver how inexpensive it was i mean i wonder you know i say it's expensive what how how do you measure what is expensive and cheap when you have money printing it. Yeah. Gold is, in my view, inexpensive compared to stocks and bonds. And real estate. It is expensive compared to the price of wheat, corn, soybeans, coffee, cocoa. Okay. It, it, you understand? Compared yeah. to other commodities. Uh, oil is cheap compared to gold and if i look at the weighting of institutions in the gold sector compared to say the weighting of institutions in the technology sector in the gold sector the weighting is at the lowest in like 50 years because the greens and the politically correct and the cancel culture people and what they're not socialist they told the institutions we don't want you to own oil companies we don't want you to own coal companies <laughs> yeah. they they just banned uh, russian exports of coal to europe now they have to go and mine again in europe for coal it's a wonderful world when you have idiots in governments. <laughs> what a world. It's so true. You know, and, and we're moving into an era where they're exerting more and more influence on the, the flow of capital and, and loans to, to companies. I mean, we have this whole sustainable finance um, issue that's coming up, another connection to the World Economic Forum, and, and also corporate governance where... They're going to be judging companies on their on their i guess it's like a social justice score of the company as well yes it's really it's it's less and less about competency and effectiveness and value it's less and less about capitalism and free markets because let's face it if it takes so much to produce a battery in terms of earth movement and the cost of producing a battery and so forth. And then how do you discard uh, the battery? Then economically, the cheapest is actually oil and gas. People think that electric cars like Tesla's and are all green, but I mean, they, they burn a lot of resources to produce and, and then to charge them. I mean, electricity doesn't come out of the wall out of the, out of thin air. I mean, it, it needs to be produced by either nuclear or coal. And I don't think that, you know, wind and hydroelectric is enough to 
charge all the world Teslas if everyone drove it's, one. It's not productive. No. The most productive is nuclear. But the green socialists, this is the one source of energy they have completely uh, banned, <laughs> sanctioned. Yeah. Now, gradually in Europe, the UK, they think, yeah, we have to have some nuclear energy. <laughs> Uh, capitalism yeah, always comes. In Germany, comes they shut them down. Oh, it's, it's crazy. Like, yeah, it's I mean, it, crazy. Uh, when you but say the these market, are the people that we have in governments. Oh yeah, no doubt. And the corporations listen to these guys. Yeah. Uh, would you argue that the market always wins in the long term? Yes. Yeah. And unfortunately, <laughs> but, we have to but, suffer through unfortunately, the. Unfortunately, you know, in Russia, the market won. <laughs> but in between, they had a hundred years, or eight years of communism. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it takes a, it takes very much too long to win sometimes for our lifetimes. So, is, is there anything the you think that we should talk about or share? I think a lot of comparisons have been made, and people think this is a correction in a bull market. But I just want to explain in two minutes the following. I lived through the 70s. When I started to work, the 10 years treasury was at 6% in 1970. And then inflation accelerated and we had the oil shock in 73, 74. Oil went from less than $2 to say between 9 and $10. And as a result, commodity price inflation accelerated. And food prices went through the roof between 72, 73, because there were some droughts. So there was this food inflation. But after 73, uh, the oil price was steady for a while. It went up higher later on, but food prices came down. Wholesale prices started to go down again and commodity prices came off. They were still rising, but not at the same rate as before. But by 73, at the top, the prime rate was over 10%. And the 10 years treasury, okay, the 10 years treasury went to a high of 12.91% in 73. Inflation subsequently accelerated until 1980. And then the 10 years treasury went to over 15% to be specific to 15.84% in September 1981. Now, at the present time, the Fed, so the inflation today is at the level of 73, 74, but at the time, the Treasury was at over 12%, and now the Fed is debating whether we will increase interest rates by one quarter of a percent or half a percent. Right. But they haven't tightened, they haven't taken back or reduced the balance sheet. They're still buying assets. The people at the Fed are completely brainwashed. Brain damaged is a better expression. They shouldn't be there. They should be all hanged. But uh, what I want to say, there was a, there is an economist is still alive. He became famous because he worked out the formula how to calculate the rate, the federal fund rate, to be neutral. In other words, uh, to produce a price level that is essentially steady, stable. So during times of high inflation, it may go up a little bit more than what the rate of inflation is to bring down inflation. And inflation is, uh, goes negative, it may go down a bit more. Anyway, according to this rule, which is called the Taylor Rule, according to economist John Taylor, he was a candidate for the Federal Reserve, but uh, Trump, he chose Powell and not Taylor, 
because under the Taylor rule now, the Fed fund rate would be at 9.81%. 9.81%. The world would be very different. Powell and all these clowns are telling you all inflation is transitory. Well, they they all subscribe to modern modern monetary theory. (laughs) Well, this is, uh, you have to see this kind of nonsense is welcomed by Wall Street. I always told all my friends on Wall Street, and I know some of the top managers and so forth of hedge funds and fund management companies. I told, I don't understand. You have good education. You went to Ivy League universities. You know the, that money printing is no good. But you don't stand up and you never criticize the Federal Reserve simply because. For you, the most important is that year for year assets go up because you get your fees from that. But on moral grounds, uh, this is, of course, wrong. You should, if you're in that league of money that you are already on Wall Street, everybody's earning well, they should have criticized the Federal Reserve for their easy monetary policies beginning in the 1980s. And you remember, I always said, this is a landmark decision. This is a milestone in financial history. The bailout of LTCM. Yeah, I remember that very well. 1998. Because that gave a signal to Wall Street, leverage up. You can do anything. You'll be bailed out. That, that ushered in the grand error of moral hazard. Yes, this is one of the big, big mistakes that occurred. And it was then used. Uh, we had the housing bubble and, you know, criminals, they didn't go to jail. No one went to they jail. They should have. They and I, I suspect no one's going to go to jail next time the... The bubble bursts and everything falls apart. Nobody, nobody, never. They'll catch some small fries, you know, not the big guys. Mark, I appreciate your time so much. It's uh, it's been about an hour. I don't want to take any more of your time because I I value it. It's nice nice to talk to you. Oh, it was great talking to you too. So you're well, and I hope your viewers are well. Yes. uh, You know, it's a kind of a almost demoralizing phase to see that some people have the objective to destroy the Western society and our freedom and uh, the, the institutions and the legal system, which was relatively strict, upon which we build the prosperity because it goes back to, you know, your property rights. Once you don't know how to define a woman and a man, uh, it will be difficult to define what is your property and what is mine. Yes. Yes, absolutely. We have to realize that. (laughs) I I agree with you 100%.